applying for a tenure track faculty position. A lot of graduate school students have academia on their career path. And I'll start out by saying, at least in STEM areas, science, technology, engineering, and math, some high percentage, it's probably like 70, 80% of PhDs actually work in industry. And there's this common misconception, if you get a PhD, you gotta teach. And that's completely not true. Now in other areas, in liberal arts or whatever, maybe that's true, I don't know much about those disciplines. But certainly here in STEM, working in industry is the primary career path that people pursue. But here I want to talk about the professor career path, talk about what that entails and the advantages and drawbacks. And I'm going to be pretty honest here. What I see are, are the benefits and the drawbacks. But again, just my view on this. Then I want to talk about the typical application package and what the what the uh, committees are looking for in new faculty. And I've served and chaired many of these. So I think I have some amount of wisdom to share with you. The professor career path. So the typical career path for a professor, they start off as a graduate student and they get a relevant PhD in an area they want to work in. They then get a job as a postdoc for a few years. Think of this, if we compare this to the medical world as their residency. And hopefully you get some experience there actually writing proposals, securing funding, leading a team, generating your own ideas. And then somewhere near the end of that, you start applying and interviewing for a faculty position. And traditionally, you would start as an assistant professor. After uh, six years or so, five or six years, you would get tenure and promotion at that point to an associate and then become a full professor. And then that's really it. No more raises and promotions unless you want to go into administration. Now, what is becoming more and more common, and I think this is unfortunate, are graduates that jump straight from being a grad student to applying, interviewing, and becoming an assistant professor and never serving as a postdoc. And in my experience, while many times with the proper training and support from university, uh, these types of folks can be successful, they struggle a lot. Uh, they don't know how to write proposals or originate ideas or lead teams or teach. And there's definitely some missing skills there that with the right postdoc, you can fill in those skills. So a typical tenure, tenure track professor is expected to do three things. And I've written down percentages here and roughly the, the fraction of time they're expected to spend in that. And this can vary from university to university. Some universities are much more teaching focused I think more research focused, some might even be service focused. But in general, I would say the typical faculty is expected to spend half their time doing research. So this means doing business development activities like going to conferences, meeting people, writing proposals, mentoring their students, uh, coaching them through writing papers, all of that sort of stuff. 40% of their energy and effort being devoted to teaching. So this is developing new courses at the university teaching those, working in their office hours, possibly integrating their research into the classroom, and then 10% service activities. And this can vary wildly. You can do service as you know, helping to organize a conference or helping out the university or college at a certain level by serving on committees or doing other tasks for them. Maybe you're doing outreach or some kind of philanthropy, but basically using your position to help people. And those percentages can also evolve over a professor's career, but I think this is typical for a starting tenure track professor. The research side, so roughly 50%, um, you'll be expected to develop and pursue your own ideas. It's generally considered weak if somebody comes in and wants to keep working with their advisor, and that's that's sort of a sign of somebody who doesn't have any ideas of their own, and that's a, a danger sign when they talk too much about working with their old research group. You know, they're certainly probably gonna continue to work in a similar area, but the, the committee that's hiring these folks is much more looking for new ideas and fresh thoughts and those wanting to break away from that and do their own thing. You're expected to write proposals and win external funding. And that's probably the biggest thing for getting tenure. 
I would think if you're pulling in millions of dollars and you're a terrible teacher, you'll get tenure. Unfortunately, uh, we'd like to think you you had to excel in all, but you know the world always seems to come down to money. So that's probably the biggest thing. If you're worried about tenure, pull in lots of funding, and I think the universities will be willing to overlook possibly weak teaching or weak service activities. You're going to be required to recruit, mentor, and graduate students. If you've not graduated any students, PhD students, you will struggle to get tenure at that university. You're expected to publish and disseminate. Now, how quickly you publish and disseminate, I think, depends on your area. As I understand it, people that work with human subjects, uh, the publication rate is a lot slower. I could be wrong about that. That's not what I do. People that do numerical modeling, that's relatively easy to have a high publication rate, but that doesn't mean you're doing better than that person that's doing human studies. It just changes depending on the discipline, but you are expected to publish and disseminate your research at a sufficient rate, whatever that might be. You'll be expected to establish partnership and collaborations both inside the university and external to the university. They would like you to patent things, to license those patents and start to work towards commercializing them. Even if you're leaning on other folks to do that, maybe you do the science, you get the patent, but then you do, you, you shake hands with different businesses and get them to license your technology to push it towards commercialization. Uh, the university typically will not push things to commercialization. They will lie on you for that. Teaching, they will like you to develop new courses. In addition to teaching catalog courses, you might be asked to teach some undergraduate class, you know, my area of electrical engineering, circuit theory. And maybe that's not what you want to teach, but you may be expected to teach that. Uh, you'll be expected to have office hours commensurate with how much you're teaching. You'll be asked to participate in ABAC activities, so that's the accreditation organization. And every once in a while, they'll do an audit of your department and university to make sure you're teaching sufficiently and that's a whole thing in of itself that I don't want to get into, but you'll have to participate in that. Uh, you'll be asked to incorporate technology into the classroom. Maybe that's putting up overhead projections uh, or uh, of different visualizations. Maybe it's a technology demonstration into the classroom. Uh, you'll be expected to experiment with modern teaching methods, things like flipped classroom and and project-based learning and all that. And you'll have to keep up with the current trends and experiment with this. And not all will work. And maybe some methods are really effective, just not effective for you. So you also should consider yourself in this, but that's what's expected of you in teaching. In service, there's lots of ways to do service. You can serve on committees at the university. You can even serve on external committees. But those committees and different various projects like participating in ABET, that could definitely be helping your department, college, or university. Community philanthropy. You can perform peer reviews. This is an excellent way to stay abreast of what's going on because you'll get to read papers before they're even published. And you're, you're doing those authors a favor by reviewing their paper. My recommendation there, no matter how bad or good the paper is, be complimentary and be as helpful as you can in those reviews. And try to do more than just find spelling errors and stuff. You know, look for, hey, I think you could describe this concept a little bit better. I'm not sure this equation is quite right. That data is not very convincing to me. I think you could beef up the background section. So try to be as helpful as you can to them. You could serve as an editor for a journal where you're actually the one coordinating the peer reviews. Another good way to keep abreast of what's going on. You could participate in conferences and symposiums, particularly organizing them, be an organizer for it. You can do various outreach activities and hold different uh, activities at high schools. You can help and mentor other faculty. You could help and mentor high school students. A variety of other things that you can do as service. And I'm going to be as honest as I can be here and discuss what I see as the benefits and drawbacks of being a professor. And this is from my perspective. I think other people in different life circumstances might see different benefits and drawbacks, and that's okay. For me, probably the number one benefit of working in academia is the intellectual freedom. So I was actually first in industry. I worked in industry for, I'll say, 15 years. I'd have to go back and calculate that. But I think I worked in industry about 15 years before joining academia. And what was happening to me is I had a whole bunch of crazy ideas 
that I just wasn't getting to to work on. I mean, imagine I'd go to my boss and say, hey, I got this crazy idea. You know, there's a 99 percent chance it's going to fail. It's going to take me three years of full time effort and ten million dollars. Well, that your boss is going to look at you and say, you're nuts. There's no way we're going to do that. But in academia, hey, that sounds cool. Can I help? So it's a lot more free to pursue those risky, crazier things, although there's still a cost of failure and being being too much of a rebel. I think academia has a lot more flexible work schedule than working in industry, although I think the newer trend in industry is to to accommodate a flexible work schedule. But for me, for, for health reasons, like I'm dealing with diabetes and exercise really helps me keep my blood sugar down. And there's certain times of day that I need to exercise. And if I had a standard industry job, I think it would be a lot more difficult to keep myself healthy. So that's something that's valuable to me. Um, well, I already mentioned the third bullet here. So uh, I am much more able to pursue high risk research. And you have to remember when you're in academia, my primary job is to mentor and coach students through research to get them advanced degrees. It's not – the research is not my primary job. My primary job is the students. So if I try something so risky and we, we try and try and try and just aren't successful at that, very often students can still get PhDs. I may not be successful at the research, but ultimately I'm still successful at my job. And so I think of all areas of life, this has the most tolerance for high risk type of research. So it's a wonderful place to be that way. Working in academia, I can do research and be an entrepreneur at the same time. Now there are some industry jobs where that is also possible, but more typically they have you sign forms and non-compete forms and anti-pillaging and other things that basically say whatever you do belongs to us and you really can't do anything else money making on the side or at least nothing in our same area. So you'll be a lot more limited to do your own entrepreneurial things working in industry than in academia. In fact, it's encouraged in academia because you can license your own technology that brings money back to the university. It, it builds the local economy. It's a, it's a path to hire students. So universities look on that very favorably. Uh, in industry, if you get a patent, you usually get a little more than a pat on the back. Sometimes you'll get a little bit of money. But in academia, you can collect royalties off those patents if you manage to get some kind of license in place. And as I mentioned before, this is not something that universities typically invest in actively doing. They want to do that, but you need to do the legwork to find those companies that will license that and work to get that in place. But once that is in place, when money's made and royalties start flowing, you get a percentage of that. And that's very unlike an industry job. I'm sure that option is out there somewhere, uh, but I've never experienced it. Another great thing, it's very rewarding to help people. And, you know, there's some students that are struggling and you can say the right words or invest enough time in them and suddenly their eyes light up, they get it. It really turns around their life. And so, Helping people in that way and helping them build their careers can be incredibly rewarding. Um, you know, working directly with students is, is my favorite part of the job. Um, the, the more senior I get, uh, the more administrative stuff that I have to take on, the less I'm able to do that. And just to be blunt, I don't think I'm enjoying my job as much when I'm not working directly with students. So I really enjoy that part. Now some drawbacks. Being a professor is a lot of work, and I'm talking about STEM. I can't talk for the other disciplines. They'll have to talk for themselves, but you're expected to do a lot, and there's sort of this misconception that, hey, go be a professor because you, you teach a few classes and get your summers off and play golf the rest of the time, and that really can't be farther from the truth. So there's some workshops, and I, I picked this up from one of those, and I, I wish I remembered exactly where. But uh, the rule of thumb is you subtract your age from 100, and that's how many hours per week you should be working to be successful in academia. And that makes a lot of sense. I think it's actually underestimating how much time you'd really have to work. Now, you can work a 40-hour week and be successful enough in academia to keep your job. But if you have any level of ambition, it's just going to take more than that. It's going to be a hustle. Um, there's been plenty of times where I was consistently working 100 plus hour work weeks, uh, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year uh, to get to where I am. There are some stressors, for example, in academia, if you're on the tenure track, if you do not get tenure in six years, you get fired. 
Uh, usually they give you some kind of consolation year where you can use that year to to look for another job, but uh, it's a, it's get tenure or you're gone, and that that's a lot of stress. And if you do any Googling about tenure track positions, most of the discussion I think is related to the stress of earning tenure and what it takes to do that. And I think I think one of the big mistakes there is where tenure's the goal and you're moving your chess pieces around the board in order to get tenure. I think people would be a lot more successful if they didn't focus on tenure, but just focused on what it is they have to do to be successful. Uh, to me, it's kind of like when you're driving a car, how are you going to be driving better? If you're looking immediately in front of you because you don't want to hit anything, that's like looking at your tenure or looking way up ahead. Um, it's better to look ahead, not not immediately in front of you, or it's going to be hard to stay between the lanes looking immediately in front of you. So uh, that's a big stressor for a lot of people. The other thing is it's a highly distracting job. And by that, I mean, it's just a steady stream of interruptions and emergencies. It's hard to have any alone time to get difficult things done. I'm the type of I'm working through something difficult. Um, I can get myself in a mode where I'm, you know, hyper fixated on it and concentrating on it. And I'm actually very easily startled. Startled If somebody comes in while I'm doing that. Uh, it scares the daylights out of me. <laughs> um, but if, you know, my phone's constantly ringing or buzzing, somebody's constantly knocking at the door, there's constantly an emergency, and I'm, I'm not able to get that uninterrupted time. And that can be very, very frustrating, particularly when you have some difficult time consuming things to do. And I think most people end up working at night uh, just to have that time of peace. I have found I, f I find that peaceful time in the morning. But anyway, very distracting job, much more distracting than working in the industry in my experience. Academic jobs pay, uh, that's discussed, that's arguable, I guess, but in my experience, about 40% lower than you'd be earning in industry. And that's a tough one to swallow. And so, well, why would somebody do that? Well. That's because I have actually other avenues for income. I can get license agreements in place and collect royalties. I can spin off my own company, right? There's, and I'm also more free in my job. So that lower salary pays for that freedom. The other thing, and probably my biggest stressor is that if you wanna get paid during your summer, you're going to have to win external funding and then pay yourself out of that. And you're forced to make decisions like, do I pay my students this summer or do I pay myself? And that's a really, really tough position. And if you don't win that money, you don't get your summer salary. So, you know, a quarter to a third of your income is just gone. So every year, a third of your income is in jeopardy. And that's, I think, my biggest stressor. And the other side of that is, do I pay myself or do I pay my students or do I pay to keep the, the research going? Very, very tough decision to make, in my opinion. Okay, so that's what it takes and what's expected of you to be a professor, what I see as the drawbacks and benefits of that. So now let's say you wanna apply for a faculty position and you're required to put together a package. So what is that committee looking for? And what are some things you should think about and include in that package? So I've served on a lot of committees. I've chaired a lot of committees. I think I have some experience to, to draw from here and give good advice. First, I guess your application package starts with the cover letter. And this is sort of just an overall summary of everything. Um, I never liked the long cover letters. There were some cover letters that went on for five or six pages. And I would say, keep your cover letter to a single page, two pages max. and if somebody's very long-winded, immediately to me, this is a sign of somebody who can't communicate effectively. So learn how to communicate very succinctly. So in the cover letter, you wanna state the purpose of the letter, hey, I'm applying to this job, whatever. But as soon as you can, you want to establish some kind of direct and personal connection to the university. Like I grew up in that town or you know, my, my wife graduated from that university, or I want to move to this town because I play this sport and it's really big there, um, or big at that university. Is there any way to tie yourself to that university? Um, it, it's very classic that I, I read a cover letter and it's, 
I could just send that same cover letter to other universities without any changes to it. It's a very generic cover letter, and it tells me that this person probably doesn't necessarily want to work here. They just want to work somewhere, and that's a very weak cover letter. So get yourself in the zone where whatever your university you're writing to, that is the university for you and state why that is. I think you want to summarize all the key points in your application. What are all the reasons that they should want to hire you? Now, in other videos, I talk about things like personal branding, and this part, I think, comes out of that. And the ability to communicate, to summarize these key points very clearly, very bluntly, and very succinctly. The other thing is you want to show that you've research that university, you have a, an awareness of that university, and you can call out specific faculty, like, hey, this faculty is working in this area, and this is some expertise that I need on a certain research area that I'm working on, and talk a little bit about that. Maybe you identify research centers with a similar story. Maybe there's local businesses or local high schools that you would also like to work with that are specific to you. You know, show there is something special about that university and where they are so that you are specifically interested in that university. So that's the purpose of the cover letter. Typically, you'll be required to submit some kind of research statement. This is another one where don't go long. If, if I read a long research statement, I usually don't. And I usually think to myself, this is somebody who can't communicate efficiently. So my personal research statement is one page. And I've done a lot more research than most. And I have mine to one page. So if you think you need six pages for your research statement, then maybe you need to think about your communication abilities and work on that. So two page max for this. And very often they'll give you a page limit. Um, is that reinforced? Not necessarily, but if you go over, are people reading it? Are you really doing an effective job? So I say one page, most people would say two pages. Um, do that with, with what you will. But anyway, in the beginning, you want to briefly state your own research experience, significant accomplishments, and recognitions. Now, a big mistake that a lot of people make in their research statements is they spend 80% of it talking about all of the research that they have done. Well, the research statement, they're much more interested in what you will do at that university than what you have done. So talk about what you have done, particularly if you've done something significant and accomplished something or got some recognitions. Talk about that. But get past that quickly and move on to what you're going to do at that university. You definitely want to state how much funding that you have received. And so they want to know that you can secure external funding. That's a huge one. As I mentioned, that's probably the biggest metric in your ability to win tenure is your ability to pull in external funding. Because if you're really good at that, universities just seem willing to overlook being a bad teacher or not doing much service or anything like that. And I think there's good reasons for that. If you pull in a lot of money, that also supports a lot of students. And at the end of the day, that's how you produce graduate students. You have to fund their research. So definitely state that and any activities that you did to contribute to winning that money. Anyway, move on. And you want to move on to your plan of what kind of research you will do at that university and how you plan to do it. Now, a a weak research statement is one that sounds exactly like the person's dissertation. Uh, that's a sign of a huge lack of creativity, probably leaning on their old advisor to help get them established. And not that these things are bad, but the committee can smell these things and it comes across very weak. So you want to be you want to be proposing research that is unique, that's different and your plan of how you're going to do it, how you're going to equip your lab to do it, how you're going to secure the funding to do it, and so on. So you'll need to list the type of equipment that you need, the lab space you'll need, your, the number of students that you'll need, maybe even mention what you think your ideal number of students is. And I think most faculty you know, throw out numbers like three to five. Um, right now, I have 16, and I've had as few as one in the past when I first started. So I don't know what the ideal number is. It probably depends on you. Uh, one bit of advice I can have is I would not build a team of 16 if everybody's a direct report under you. You'll need some kind of hierarchy because if they're all coming to you, you will quickly find yourself overwhelmed, even though that may be the most rewarding part of your day. 
in your research plan, you want to call out spe specific faculty and centers at that university that you could collaborate with. And what this is doing is establishing that you've done your research on that university and that you would be a good fit because you find faculty and centers that could help you and you could also help those faculty and those centers. You definitely want to lay out a clear funding plan. So here's the research I want to do. Here's the government agencies or companies out there that are willing to invest in this. And the first thing I would do is write a proposal here and then write another proposal there. And maybe I build one technology with this customer base, another for that other customer base. Then I bring those together and now I can win money from this other customer base. So tie that together in a nice narrative. And maybe this bullet should have come before, but definitely describe your experience and accomplishments at winning external funding. Um, that's the biggest metric. And so the committee wants to know that you will be able to win external funding. Another very common document is a teaching statement. So a lot of what I said for the research statement applies here. Keep it short. My personal teaching statement is one page and I have a lot of unique teaching experience. I could easily make mine 20, 30 pages. And some people do that. And that's a sign of somebody who doesn't know how to communicate. And here's where that really counts. If somebody can't communicate well, they're probably not gonna be a good teacher. And it, it correlates so strongly with long-winded application statements. When they come in and teach, they score very low on their student evaluations and they're, they're not a very effective teacher. So learn to be succinct. I'll say one page, I think two pages is also okay. And typically the application process will give you some kind of page limit, but I would not go past two pages. Uh, if nothing else, they just probably won't read that much. But start off by summarizing whatever teaching experience that you have and whatever recognitions you might have. And you might think, oh, I never taught a class. Well, did you ever fill in for a lecture or two for your old advisor? Did you ever tutor somebody, right? There's, there's teaching experience that you could talk about that you may not even be thinking about. But anyway, like the research statement, talk about what you've done, but keep that the vast smaller part of this. Instead, Talk about what you will do at this university. So you're going to state your overall teaching philosophy. Um, how are you going to teach students at the university where you're applying? If you can at all make this personal and say, you know, this university, I understand you pull most of your students from this area, and maybe that's a big manufacturing area. So those students tend to be very hands on. And so uh, you'll, you'll make your classroom experience very hands on. Anything like that you could do, I think would strengthen your package. Identify any courses that you're qualified to teach and list all those. I am qualified to teach all of these. But then talk about the courses that you think you have a special amount of expertise or courses that you want to develop. You know, universities are very interested in putting new courses in their catalog. So they want to hear that. In terms of teaching, how will you incorporate your research into the classroom? Because doing that is very motivating to the students. It also recruits them into graduate school. Talk about how you'll, you'll incorporate technology into the classroom and utilize modern teaching practices. So this is things like doing graphical visualizations. Um, as augmented reality and virtual reality become more prominent, maybe you're gonna somehow work that into your classroom. Uh, you're going to do technology demonstrations, modern teaching practices, uh, that's, you know, flipped classroom, project-based learning, all of these things. And instead of just your traditional, you get up in front of the students, you say a bunch of stuff, and then you leave and give them a homework assignment. Um, what new and novel can you do? And if you can tie that a little bit to the university, that would be excellent. So that's the teaching statement. Some universities require a diversity statement. I think this is starting to disappear. And I think for good reasons. I think the good reasons are, for the most part in academia, we're really not discriminating anymore. Um, I really have not witnessed it. And so it's just less of an issue. I think also people are concerned if we're so focused on diversity, are now we hiring people in the name of diversity and ignoring others based on reasons that we say shouldn't matter? So I don't want to get into that whole debate, but some universities will require a diversity statement. And I think 
different generations of people maybe have something different in mind for a diversity statement. Uh, older folks like me, when I hear diversity, I think, you know, gender ethnicity. And I think newer folks are much more broad and more accurate on what this actually means because there's other types of diversity. There, of course, there's ethnicity and gender, but there's also diversity of income, diversity of education level, diversity of nationality, diversity of religion, diversity of favorite sports team and all that. Fundamentally, I personally think this comes down to diversity of thought. Um, I don't know if I would care if I had a group that was all one gender, one ethnicity, as long as people are thinking differently, because that's what spurs creativity and, and challenges people to think other ways. And you might argue you need all those really things to have diversity of thought, and that's a great argument to make. But fundamentally, I like thinking of diversity of thought. Certainly a diversity statement, you want to state that you're not going to discriminate. Um, the striving for diversity is probably something good to say, but I, again, I think there's a downside to that. When you strive for diversity, you know, suppose you're teaching in a country that has 80% square people and 20% circle people. Are you going to hire 50-50? Because you would be heavily discriminating against the square people. So I personally struggle with stating that I will strive for diversity. Um, instead, you could say words like you will celebrate the diversity that you have. Like in my research group, we have flags for every country that we've had a student from. Uh, and we, you know, we'll, we'll cook each other's food and we celebrate that. And it's something that's celebrated, but I don't necessarily talk about striving for that because I don't want to come across like I'm going to discriminate against other people just to get certain types of folks. Um, give any personal learning experiences you may have related to diversity. Uh, but my recommendation here is avoid telling stories where you're representing yourself as a victim of discrimination or diversity, because that's more feel sorry for me and hire me. And I think that weakens your diversity statement. Instead, talk about how you value diversity, how you've benefited from it and, you know, what you'll do to ensure it.